back to another installment of Unglum Tribe. I am Blackhawk, and this is... Anthony. And today, it's time for Origins. Today's origin stories are about turns of phrase, something that we all commonly use, but we, don't, we may not under, fully understand where they came from, why they came from. So, Except for Blackhawk, who's done the research for this project. Yes, I've so. done the research for this He's one. So. Bad, so, Yes, I do. So the first one is <coughs> a movie that I really enjoyed. This movie is Die Hard. Who doesn't like Die Hard? Yeah, Die Best Hard. Best Christmas movie ever. <laughs> it, is. it is. A lot of people think it's an action movie. It's not. It's uh, a Christmas movie. Christmas movie. That's right. Yes. All right. So... Die Hard, which is typically refers to someone with strong dedication to a per particular set of beliefs. The term Die Hard actually originated from much more literal meaning. Back in the 1700s, the expression was uh, described you, for those who were hung that didn't die right away. Hard to kill. They were known as Die Hards. Yes. Um, the phrase later became even more popular in the eight, 18, uh, I guess, 11s, 18-teens? 18-teens. Sure. I'm 18 not, knots? Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to... They were still using... They were still using... Well, yeah, they were definitely using the term then. Mm, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pronounce this right, but it's from the Battle of Albura. Al Al what you got? Right there. Albuera. Albuera, during the Napoleonic Wars. I'm just making my best guess. It's, it's, that, that works for me. Um, in the midst of the fight, a woman British officer named William Inglis supposedly urged his unit, following his bellows, stand your ground and die hard. Make the enemy pay dear for each of us. Inglis is... 57, 57th Regiment seven, suffered 75% casualty and kill rates. So die hard now is someone who is not going to give up their principles or their, or, or their morals, but it originates from people who just didn't want to die. Took a lot to, to, to off them. They were diehards, right? Sure. I mean, I, you, that's what it says. If you gotta die, you might as well die, die hard. hard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Hence, hence the movie. I mean, the only way you can top that is to die harder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next one is um, Carpe Diem, one of my absolute favorites. Um, Mine too. And had I known, uh, had any privy been privy to any of the information, I probably would have worn my shirt, which. I believe I've worn on an episode before. If I haven't, you'll see it in the future, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, it means to, believe it or not, pluck the day, not seize, as popularly believed. Believed? Believed? Believed. Both works. No, not really, but um, the original source of this Latin phrase is the lyric poet Quintus Horatius Flaccus, uh, 65 BC <laughs> to, eight, to 8 BC. Oh, poor Horatius. Uh, more widely known as Horace. The term is found uh, in Ode's book uh, one, Carpe Diem, Com Minimum Credula Postero. Are we summoning a demon? <laughs> oh Carpe Diem, <laughs> like, Quam Minimum Credulo Postero. Is there, a, is there a pentagram on the floor? <laughs> Somebody call the just, Winchesters. I, I think we um, just created one. Uh, which uh, translates as, while we're talking, envious time is fleeing. Pluck the day. Put no trust in the future. Many authors have quoted the Latin original, but it was Lord Byron's use of the phrase that first began its integration into English. He included it in his 1817 work, Letters. There's a lot of people just titling, titling books called Letters back in the day. We were just mm -hmm. discussing one. Um, actually, it was the origin of Turns of Phrase itself mm -hmm. um, that mentioned Ben Franklin uh, being the first one that not actually use it, uh, but the, per se, but the first one to have it in print, as mm -hmm. best as they could tell, in his book from 1776, Letters as well. Um, this book uh, by Thomas More, Letters, was published in 1830, and he said, I never anticipate 
carpe diem, the past at least is one's own. The past is at least one's own, which is one reason for making sure of the present. The noble George Gordon Noel, sixth Baron Byron, is better known as a womanizer than a Latin scholar, but he was well versed in the language and was a Horace uh, aficionado. An aficionado. I'm glad I read that slowly because he was a womanizer and he was a horse aficionado. <laughs> it could have been really misinterpreted. <laughs> this was supposed to be a serious piece. I'm going to find something to, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, he liked women and he liked the, uh, liked the author Horace as well. He was taught Latin as a child by the son of his late, or of his bootmaker, yeah, <laughs> the son of his late, by the son of his bootmaker and went on to write his version of Horace's Arts Poetica, where the art of poetry, as Hints from Horace in 1811. So he gave us a hint from Horace. A hint from Horace. Where he used, pluck the day, seize the day, carpe diem. So it comes from, uh, let's see, 8 BC, 65 to 8 BC, somewhere around there. Okay, so the next <coughs> one is uh, a phrase that I continue to hear even today. It's called, resting on your laurels. I know a couple of people named Laurel. I don't think any of those women would appreciate being rested upon. No, they, they may not, except for maybe their husbands. Um, so this one, <laughs> this is the idea of resting, or the idea of resting on your laurels dates back to leaders and athletic stars of ancient Greece. It comes from ancient Greece. In Hellenic times, laurel leaves were closely tied to Apollo, the god of music. Prophecy and poetry, Apollo was usually depicted with a crown of laurel leaves. And the plant eventually became a symbol of status and achievement. I think I remember the original um, Greek uh, Olympic Games where you won and you got one of those gold laurel leaf crowns, right? Or is that olive? I don't know. Anyhow. Um, the research on this one was lacking a little bit, but... <laughs> yes, yes. Um, not for the particulars that we're actually looking for. No, so. not, no not, not for those. Um, victorious athletes at the ancient Pantheon Games received wreaths made of laurel branches. And the Romans later adopted the practice and presented wreaths to generals who won important battles. Veneral Greeks and Romans, or laurelettes, were thus able to rest on their laurels by basking in the glory of past achievements. Only later did the phrase take on the negative connotation and since the 1800s it has been used for those who are overly satisfa satisfied with past triumphs. So if you do something really good and you think, you know what, I really don't have to do anything else, I have pretty much have gone to the moon and back. Have you gone to the moon and back? No, I'm talking about Neil Armstrong in this one. Oh, okay. You know. Good man. Yeah, great man. Good man. Good man. America. America. Anyways, you know, there are certain accomplishments that I have done and you have done as well. And if we just sit back and bask in our own glory for a little while, I guess that is appropriate. For too long, though, you are resting on your laurels. Anyhow, this has been another segment. Oh, of I have one. I've got a sneaker. I've got a sneaker squeaking in. Okay. This is a custom origin. Okay. Origin of customs. The origin of customs. Yes, this is a April's Fool's Day. April Fool's Day custom. Custom origin, yeah. Oh. Snuck it in on you. It's, um, oh one boy. of the origins of April Fool's Day was provided by Joseph Bosco, a professor of history uh, of, of at Boston University, and he explained that the practice began during the, the reign of Constantine when a group of court jesters and fools told the Roman emperor that they could do a better job of running the empire. Uh, Constantine, uh, amused by this, allowed a jester uh, named Kugel. Kugel. Krugel? Cousin Kugel. Kugel. Second cousin twice removed of Schmiegel. Um, to be king for one day. Uh, Kugel passed an edict calling for absurdity on that day, and the custom became an annual event. Uh, in a way, explained Boskin, it was a very serious day. In those times, fools were really wise men. Uh, it was the role of them to entertain, put, right. and, well, but to 
it was to put um, to help jesters and 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 uh, other pe- comedians and whatnot for that day to specifically make fun of certain customs and laws and stuff like that. It's, it's to help people just to take their life a little bit uh, a little bit easier. Right. You know, look. Look, look a lot at life of, yeah, with, a lot of the role was to, joking mind. Yeah, and a lot of the role was to you know um, to keep the masses happy, to keep the, yeah. to keep the king happy, but to keep the masses happy too. And a lot of uh, a lot of them back in the day were, were able to get the gain the king's favor and ear, mm-hmm. um, and served in a consort fashion as well. Well, yeah, that's what you were just saying about right. the the right. jesters. Right. Like is, the, the importance, right? The, was uh, roles that they were some of them. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the part of the jester's ro- role is not to just entertain. It was advisory capacity. Yes, as well. it was. Yeah. <clears throat> if the uh, the the king was going to make a big decision, you know, the jester would be like, "Well, if you were somebody else and someone did that to you, doesn't that seem a little ridiculous?" Right. It seems a little little. Right, because it was a non. He he held a non political role. Right. You know, when you've got your right hand guy, you get a lot of yes men in. Mm-hmm. Yes, Manning, and plus they've also got their own ends that they're trying to get yeah. to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fool, he's pretty much hit his the height of his station. You know, he's, there's really no, no going any further. So mm-hmm. it was kind of like uh, kind of like what us two idiots do on a on a regular basis. You That's know? right. So, um, anyway, we appreciate you stopping by. Uh, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. And we'll catch you the next time. And until then, I'm Anthony, and I'm Blackhawk.